Well, as Pastor Kent said, yeah, 10 weeks flies by, doesn't it? It seems like it was just yesterday, it was September, and now we're just less than two weeks away from Thanksgiving and closing up our section on Colossians. I'm so excited next week to invite back one of our own, Josh Gallagher, to share with us during Harvest Fest. And then the following four weeks after that, we're going to launch into an Advent series, an Advent series that we've titled The Songs of Christmas. Pastor Kent will start us in the first series, and then I'll walk us through the following three. And next thing you know, it'll be Christmas Eve service and the new year, and it'll be 2020. Time flies, does it not? Well, thank you for the members of the Discipleship Commission for their labor in creating our small group work, especially the questions. So a big thank you to them and their hard work. Uh, I appreciate them a great deal. I won't name names, but you know who you are. Thank you so much for your diligent work there and your good service. Well, last week, Paul spoke to us directly as husbands and wives, as children and as parents, as fathers, and as employees and employers. It was a very practical but also theological message where Paul was saying, hey, you have to live your life out in Christ at home and at work. And now in Paul's last section of his letter to the Colossians, he has a way of kind of wrapping things up and pressing home some of his big or important themes that he wants us to gather and to use in our lives starting today and for the rest of our lives. Our title for the sermon today is Staying on Mission with Christ. And if you're a note taker, you can write down these three main points. Paul's asking us to stay on mission with Christ by persisting in prayer, by walking in wisdom, and by partnering in ministry. Let me say those again. Persisting in prayer, walking in wisdom, and partnering in ministry. And I'll repeat those as we go through. Persisting in prayer, walking in wisdom, partnering in ministry. Let's stand together and read as has become our habit from Colossians. I'm going to read out loud verses 2 through the end of the book. So if your feet are hurting already from standing, you can feel free to sit down. That's fine. Um, But Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through the end of the chapter. Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Verse 5, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, Jesus, who is also called Eustace, These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea, and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Hmm. Father, may the words of my mouth, the words of my mouth, and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. And may we each here have ears that hear, eyes that see, and hearts that are soft to your touch. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. Please be seated.
staying on mission with Christ. Just driving in this morning, I was reminded of this theme in the, all of the scriptures, really. If you remember, the Old Testament is a shadow. Christ is there, but not yet fully revealed. And I was listening to Andrew Peterson's song where he, he tells in a narrative fashion the story of Abraham talking with his wife, Sarah. And he says, Sarah, I want, to, I want you to follow me into the promised land. I want you to go on this journey with me. We are, by nature, as Christians, sojourners. This is not our final home. This is not our final destination. One popular pastor, in fact, encourages his flock to be like men or women who are in a country under siege at war, to always be ready, to be in wartime, in that mindset and the way you conduct your life. I don't think he's wrong. It's easy for us to get lulled into the day-to-day and the mundane, isn't it? And to forget that we are not of this world anymore. And we look for the kingdom and the consummation of what Jesus is doing in our lives and will perfect when we are brought with Christ, raised with him, to see him face to face. So Paul wants these dear people, and thus God wants us, his dear people, to stay on mission with Jesus, to not lose sight of where we're going, even in the midst of hardship, in the midst of the mundane, in the midst of different trials. And he begins, just as he did his letter, with prayer. Just as he did his letter with prayer. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now this is familiar, because Paul in verses, chapter 1, verse 3 says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Paul's almost first words are prayer. And next in verse 9, he says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So it is a theme with Paul and really throughout all of his letters and through the whole Bible, that prayer is of utmost importance for us as Christians. So Paul exhorts and models steadfast prayer. Steadfast, or Acts 6, verse 4, translates that same word as follows, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And in Romans, Paul writes in verse 12 of chapter 12, rejoice in hope Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. So continuing steadfastly or translated devote yourselves or be constant in prayer. Paul exhorts us in that fashion. And it reminds me of Luke's gospel, chapter 18. Do you remember this parable of the persistent widow? Luke writes as Jesus spoke and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he, that is the judge, refused, but afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, (laughs) I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual upcoming. Verse 6, And the Lord said, that is Jesus, said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So when Jesus returns, Will he find us remaining faithful in prayer? Or will will we have given up, thinking he doesn't listen? And don't forget the point of that parable. It's a lesser to greater, greater argument. If that wicked judge gives in to the persistent widow, how much more will God, your righteous Father, who is a judge, listen to your prayers and answer them? Don't let that promise and that point leave you, friends. So when Paul says, continue steadfastly, 
in prayer. Perhaps he had that widow in mind, that tenaciousness, that always praying, because behind that is a faith that says, my Father in heaven hears and is glad to answer prayers. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Reminds me of the first Corinthians and Paul's letter in verses 13 of chapter 16. He says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. First Thessalonians 5, chapter 6, he says, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Be watchful and be sober. And Peter adds in his letter, his first letter, chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So when Paul says, continue steadfastly <clears throat> and be watchful, those are good verses to remember. And especially what First Peter adds to it, be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking somewhere, someone to divide, to, to devour, excuse me. Now this isn't the first time that that. Paul has talked about being watchful. Nor has Jesus. Jesus talks about being watchful several times in one of the last passages of Scripture where he's alive, the Garden of Gethsemane. We won't read this together, but if you're a note taker, Mark chapter 14, verses 32 and following. And we know the story, and when we get to Easter, I'm sure we'll read it again, that Jesus takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he takes the three with him and says, sit here and pray. Right? You remember that? And then Jesus goes off and prays and says, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will be done, but yours. And Jesus is praying so much that he's sweating drops of blood or tears of blood. In verse 38 of Mark's account, Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is is weak. It was true for them then, and it's true for us now. Prayer is not only something to be consistent in, but it's something to be watchful in. Just a few weeks ago, we talked about how easy it is for us to forget to put off the old self and walk in the ways that are comfortable to us in our flesh, to be that angry husband, or to be that disrespectful employee, or to put on the things that we just were before Christ. It, is, it takes incredible diligence and power by the Spirit. And prayer, my friends, is simply talking with our Heavenly Father and recognizing, I realize I'm tempted here, Lord. Help me. Surely it's even part of the Lord's Prayer, which we could recite right now. Lead us not into temptation. So, Paul, continuing steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, turns to verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us, he says, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. And Paul talks about the mystery several times. In chapter 1, of Colossians, verse 26, again in verse 27, chapter 2, verse 2, and he talks about how Christ is the mystery revealed, hidden in the Old Testament, revealed in the New, the shadow that has now been brought into the light. And Paul believes clearly that prayer, my friends, is essential for the proclamation of the gospel. Effective evangelism, R.C. Lucas writes, effective evangelism begins with persevering prayer. Effective evangelism begins with persevering prayer. It starts with us talking to God about the people in our lives. It starts with us talking to God about the people in our lives and then talking to people about the God in our lives. Talking to God first, praying 
to the Lord about these people and then watching God give you the strength and the wisdom to talk with them about your faith, to share with them. Paul is asking the Colossians, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. It's a dangerous prayer to pray this week because it means we have to be willing to go through that door. Right? Why pray, God, open a door into the hearts of one of my friends that I've been burdened for or one of my coworkers or my children or my grandchildren? Then it means we need to be watchful, friends, for that opportunity. We need to be ready. What does Paul say next? To declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, Paul reminds them. But what does he say here? That I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. So we're persistent in our prayer, we're persevering, and we're watchful in our prayer, and we're thankful in our prayer. And we pray, if you will, for the frontline privilege of sharing our faith with others. And we pray with our fellow missionaries. We have them every here a week. We, we rotate through our missionaries. Friends, it is not a small task for you to pray for them. It is an incredibly important, eternal task. Labor in prayer as the Lord leads you. Effective evangelism begins with persevering prayer. Well, Paul calls us <clears throat> to a persisting in prayer, and now he turns to walking in wisdom. Chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 5. Paul says, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt. And I'll stop there. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Time. Don't we wish we had more of it? Really, you don't? Am I the only one? Right? But it's the one thing you can't get more of. You can never add a single second onto the day. Time is precious. Time is precious. And it seems like it's always fleeting, doesn't it? It seems like it is always fleeting. Paul's been burdened for the Colossians to walk in wisdom since the very beginning of the letter. He says in verses 9 and 10, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with all knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge <coughs> of God. Paul says in Ephesians, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. And boy, some days feel more evil than others, don't they? You had this many things to do on your task list, right? Your to-do list, and you got none of them done. <laughs> or you got two of them done. It was perhaps a circumstance that you just couldn't prevent, or maybe you realized, I need to forgo my list for something else. But time is always fleeting, and Paul says it's even evil in this sense. How are we handling our time and how are we walking in our wisdom as we manage our time? Make the best use of it. Again, if we're going to pray with Paul for those in our lives that God's burdened us with, prayer, those that we want to see come to faith in Christ, then we need to be attentive to our time and willing to make a change in our schedule should the opportunity arise. <clears throat> Paul then goes on in verse 6, should that opportunity arise, how does he describe our speech? Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer, answer each person. In my experience, there's nothing more off-putting than somebody who is belligerent or talks down to you or me or someone who just, from the very beginning of the conversation, judges me. That's the opposite of gracious speech. And there are probably some other uh, examples I could give as well. Especially in our day and age, Christian, we cannot expect to have an audience with a coworker if we're not going to be gracious in the way that we talk. If it's an us versus them mentality, we immediately put people on the defense. It puts me on the defense. And you, we're not about putting people on the defense. 
We're about sharing something good, something amazing, life-changing. So think about that in your talk, in your conversation, in your speech. Is it gracious when you talk about your Lord, your faith? And is it seasoned with salt? Immediately when we think of salt, I know, at least I know I did, I thought of the Beatitudes and I thought of the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' words that, you know, what good is salt if it loses its saltiness? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about that ability to just have the right word at the right time. And I, having seen it in my own life, it's rarely because of my smarts. It's rarely because of my wit. It's because it just seems like God put the right word there for the right time. And I just got to be the vessel for it. Be gracious in our speech and seasoned with salt. There's a story of Malcolm Muggeridge, the great British (coughs) uh, writer, and his encounter with Mother Teresa. And though he had a lot of questions about Christianity and saw, as a reporter, the ugliest side of Christianity, abuse and scandals, power trips, etc., he couldn't shake the witness that Mother Teresa was. He just couldn't shake what she was doing with her life. Her life was so well lived that he just couldn't shake it. And they had a discussion once where he kind of gave his reasons for why he wasn't a Christian or why he was at least a skeptic, someone in the crowd but not yet a committed follower. And she sent him something. I believe it was a devotional. And the timing of that devotional and the words were seasoned with the right amount of salt that Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, I believe it was in his last decade of his life, became a Christian. Notice her actions spoke loudly and then her words were rightly timed, gracious, and seasoned with salt. It can be no different for us, right? Last week we talked about it. How can we profess a beautiful Savior if our lives at home and work don't reflect that? It will make our words just a bunch of nonsense, chaff floating in the wind to blow away. Walking in wisdom, persevering in prayer. Why all of this? So that we can partner together with Jesus and with each other in ministry. Now we read verses 7 through the end of the chapter. And if you're like me, it it felt a little bit like reading in the book of Numbers, if you've ever gone through Numbers, and there are these genealogies, you just try to get through them. And you wonder, how do you pronounce half these names? But we're going to walk through this, because I... These are names that you've seen in Scripture other places, most of them. And if nothing else, it reminds us of the obvious, that Paul or Peter or any of the apostles didn't do ministry on their own. It was always a partnership with other Christians, a partnership with bodies, with the church of Jesus Christ. So Paul begins with Tychicus, a weird name for sure, hard to say, Tychicus will tell you about all my activities. He is a beloved brother. And then he goes on to Onesimus. Onesimus, just a little bit further down there in verse 9. And we have two faithful friends of the church that Paul applauds. Tychicus, who's a faithful brother, minister, fellow servant of the Lord, verse 7. And Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Now, if you've read your New Testament, you know that Onesimus is the subject of Paul's letter to Philemon. Because Philemon is a master, Onesimus is the slave. But notice Paul doesn't refer to him as a slave here, does he? My fellow brother, a faithful brother. So Paul commends these two brothers, Tychicus, (laughs) that's hard to say, and Onesimus. And then he talks about three Jewish men. Well, how do you know they're Jewish, Kevin? Because he says in verse 11, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, which is another way of saying these are the only Jews in this area that are working for the Lord. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, so you have one prisoner. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. (coughs) And we have Jesus, who is also called Eustace. Now you may remember Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, because Barnabas and Paul had a disagreement about him in the book of Acts. And they actually parted ways over Mark. It's good to see that Mark is back in the fold and walking with Jesus. Three slaves for Christ is next 
on Paul's list. Tychicus, Epaphras, and Archippus in verse 17. Tychicus, Epaphras, and Archippus. <clears throat> we mentioned Tychicus already. We have Epaphras now. Who is the man who planted this church? Verse 12. He is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayer. There's prayers again. That you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. There are brothers and sisters in this church who are an Epaphras to you, aren't they? Think about it. There are those brothers or sisters who you know they're always praying for you. What a blessing they are in your life. Imagine your faith without those brothers or sisters praying for you, caring enough to ask you via a quick message in the lobby or a text, hey, how are you doing? Don't take those for granted. There's a temptation in our culture to say, well, I'm not sure what to do with the church, so I'm just going to kind of follow Jesus on my own. For many other reasons, that's a mistake. This is just one reminder. You'll be missing out on all those prayers, on all that support, all that fellowship if you try to go the Lone Ranger route. Well, we have one physician on board that, Peter, that Paul mentions. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. And we know Luke because he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. He traveled with Paul extensively in the book of Acts. You can tell he's a first-hand witness to a great deal of what goes on there. Most scholars believe he interviewed Peter as well, and that's where he gets a lot of his information about the, from the gospel from. He not only was a good physician, but a historian, and one of the greatest historians in all of the world. And Demas. Demas, unfortunately, doesn't continue to walk with the Lord. Paul says later in one of his letters to Timothy that Demas departed to be with the world, to follow whatever pleasures he found in the world more appealing than Jesus. In verse 15, not to be overlooked, the rose among the thorns, Nympha. So Paul says, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea, and then he later says, bring this letter there, for that's how they would hear. The, red, the letter was read throughout all the churches if there were multiple gatherings in Colossae, and then it was passed to the other churches, and they would read it out loud, maybe multiple times over multiple weeks. Greetings, give my greetings, he says, to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha, who's a sister, and the church in her house. We don't know anything else about her, but if she had a house, that means she had means. We don't know if she had a husband who loved the Lord or if she was a widow, but she had means and she used them. And she is remembered here, the one woman among the nine men that Paul sends greetings to. <clears throat> this is Paul's personal, personal touch to some degree, but he makes it even more personal at the very end of his letter in verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. The very first week I spoke about how oftentimes authors would dictate to a secretary. Many believe Timothy was that secretary for Paul here. So Paul is dictating under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and, and Timothy's dutifully writing it down. It would explain by, if you look at the letters of 1 Peter and 2 Peter, the styles are very different. Bible-believing scholars would say, you know, Peter didn't write down 1 Peter, he dictated it, but probably wrote 2 Peter by hand because the style is a little more like a fisherman, less complex. Still both inspired. But Paul adds this personal touch. He does this several times throughout the New Testament in his own hand, and it must have been obvious on the, on the original manuscript that this was his handwriting. These are Paul's last words to the Colossians. And he labors to see them and us walking or persevering in prayer, walking in wisdom, and partnering in ministry. Why go through all these names in verses 7 through verse 18? Well, one, they're inspired. This is still part of Scripture, as boring as it might be for some of us. But two, as I said earlier, it reminds me and reminds us that this wasn't just like the Avengers where you had a group of six or eight people who conquered the world or saved the world. But this is God working through common people like you and me. Common people like Tychicus, Demas, Nympha. Just average Joes, average Janes. God often uses the lesser or the weaker vessels for his glory. Think of the Old Testament and how many 
younger brothers are more prominent than their older. David, the seventh of seven sons. Jacob wasn't the oldest. Isaac wasn't the oldest. God loved to go against the cultural trends. Friends, if you are not mentioned in the prayers of others here, maybe it's because you're not known. Maybe it's because it's been easier to stay safe and kind of anonymous. I want to encourage you, you're missing out on dessert. You're missing out on the best part of the fellowship. You're getting some meat and potatoes from the pulpit and the worship, but you're missing out on dessert. You're missing out on what can help cat- catapult you to some great growth and greater holiness. I realize people are scary and they're going to hurt you. And some of you come from a very wounded background, like myself, whether it was your family of origin or circumstances. But don't let that distract you from pursuing, partnering in the ministry, being one who is prayed for and praying for others. It doesn't mean you need to jump into ministry right now, but we need you as the body. I need you, you need me. We're in this together. Be known is another way to say that. Be known, be on somebody's prayer list and get to know people well enough that you know how to pray for them. And watch how God works in your life. Watch how he works in the small group that you plug into or the life groups or just the talk in the lobby. Watch how God begins to work in ways he hasn't previously. It's no surprise to me or to him. He designed the body for that purpose. We're not lone rangers in this, friends. We'll never make it. We need each other. And that is part of what it means to know Christ in all his fullness, which has been the theme for our book here in Colossians. We cannot know Christ in all his fullness if we're isolated, but we can as we grow together and sharpen one another, as we walk together in prayer, as we walk together in wisdom, and we seek to partner in ministry. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I am second because you are first. We are second because you are first. Thank you for the words in Colossians that we've been studying these past 10 weeks. Thank you for the way your spirit meets with the word and pierces our hearts. Thank you that you do not leave us where we are, though you accept us as we are, but you continue to desire to see your glory more and more in each of our lives. Oh, Father, if there are some of us who are brave enough to pray for opportunities to share, for a window, for a door to open up, Father, show them how you will meet them with the gracious and salt-flavored words that they need. What greater joy is it than to share our joy with others and to see them take that joy of salvation as their own. Father, you have, you have poured out an abundance of riches on us in Christ. If we had nothing else but our faith and we were huddled in houses as the secret church in China is, we would be richer in Christ than any other billionaire. And yet you have given us even more than we deserve, far more. Our cup overflows with the fellowship we share, with the freedom we have in worship, with the building that we enjoy so much. Continue your good work, Jesus, of magnifying yourself and of forming us more into your image so that we might know all the more your fullness this year and for years to come. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen.